All right, well, let's get started. Um, tonight's lesson is the seventh in this new series in 1 John. This lesson, was, and this lesson happened by accident. Um, let me try to explain. I had no intentions of doing another lesson from chapter one. Uh, I felt like when we got to 1 John 1, 9 last week, I gave it a deep dive, treated 1 John 1, 9 the way I wanted to answer the age old question I get, which is, hey, what do you think of 1 John 1, 9? Um, felt really good about it when I left, but had this little nagging feeling in the back of my mind all week that I left some things undone and thought, well, we'll see how it falls out when we start to take notes for this week. Well, when I sat down to do that, that nagging feeling got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, I just decided, okay, well, let's just run with that, try to get that nagging feeling gone and see where we land. And the more that I opened this up today, the more I realized that I need to do some more work inside of 1 John 1, 9 to help with 1 John 1, 10 to make the turn to 1 John 2, 1. Um, and not to drag it out and to add, say the same old stuff, but to really find in there. And so that's what I started to do. And as that happened, um, the title that you see, the catharsis of confession really started to roll out of some of the Greek work from 1 John 1, 9. And that got me back on where we ended last week, where we end up in James, where James gives you the other alternate of confess. And I realized, well, there's work that we didn't really dig into last week in that text to do that context, a fair shake. So let's try to do that tonight. And in doing so, this would really be a good part two to the first John 1, 9. So for those who are watching, if you haven't watched number six, uh, Confess and Cleanse, I highly recommend Confess and Cleanse. It will give you a really good contextual view of what's going on First John 1, 9, all right? Now, I wanna to start tonight a little different. We've done this before. I don't think we've done this so much in this series, but I wanna to start tonight not in the text. I want to remind you of the word cleanse from First John 1, 9, in which John says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And last week we did some work on the words forgive and cleanse. I think one of the things that bugged me all week long was that I didn't really, really dig into cleanse in the Greek. Um, I, I quoted the root. I misquoted for you the usage of the root. I kind of knew I was doing it when I was doing it. It was one of those moments where I'm thinking ahead and I kind of misquote the usage, but I let it hang thinking I'll fix it and I didn't fix it. And then all week I thought I should have fixed that. Um, and so this is my chance to fix that and to, and to take us a little deeper. So I want you to think about that phrase cleanse that John used in 1 John 1, 9. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm tr really not trying to drag this intro. I just really feel like our mindset sometimes needs reset. So let me try to do that. It's easy to think that our writers of the Bible sat down with a pen and a parchment or paper and they sort of closed their eyes and they took that pen and they said, Holy Spirit, what would you have me to say? And that they just sort of started moving it. And then they moved to the next line and then the Holy Spirit used them almost robotically to write. Now we kind of laugh at that, but in a way we kind of had that in there, or at least maybe I'm the only one, but we kind of had this, this vision of these men of renown who sort of were conduits. I think I even used that word years ago. They were conduits of what the Holy Spirit was trying to say. And what I saw of a conduit was that they just, they just moved, man. They just did what they heard the Holy Spirit say. And while I do believe the Holy Spirit inspired the writing, and I do believe the Holy Spirit anointed the writing and spoke to it, otherwise, forget it. We just throw your Bible out. And what's it matter? Um, I do believe that. But I, I also rarely took into account that they brought something to the table of their own education, of their own ability to write, of their own ability to use narrative, of their own ability to highlight metaphor or allegory. They, bought, they brought their own humor into the writings. They brought their level of writing skill into the writing or their lack of skill. All of those things are beneath the surface. Sometimes they show up in the English in the way it's translated, but a lot of times they're down there in the Greek. Now, not only do they bring their writing to the table, they bring their education to the table. Like watch Paul with the way he writes versus the way Peter 
writes and you see a difference in their basic fundamental understanding of Torah and in the way that they present themselves in the Greek. Or watch the author of Hebrews whose Greek usage is entirely different than any other book of the New Testament um, being written from what seems to be someone else's pen. And that's fine. And they're bringing that, those ideas. We tend to think, and by we, I really just mean me, but I'm going to throw all of us in there. We tend to think that the education they bring is entirely spiritual, like their knowledge of Torah or the Psalms or the things they learned from reading the rabbinical traditions. But it's not all entirely Torah or even spiritual. It's often quite secular. Paul was fond more than once of quoting secular writers, which meant Paul was reading secular literature. And by secular, I simply mean that which wouldn't have been considered inspired by the pen of God, whether it be poets or playwrights or whatever they might have had. And so that, all that knowledge, even when they don't quote it and say, so-and-so said, when you have this body of knowledge out here that's considered secular literature, and then you see something show up in the New Testament writing that doesn't get its legs until the secular says it first, you might be dealing with that person's education coming to the page. What they heard said over here starts to influence what they say over here. And I present you tonight with that very strong possibility with the word cleanse. The Greek word katharize, by which we derive the word catharsis. Now, watch the secular birth of catharsis. Catharsis is a metaphor used by Aristotle in his Poetics. Poetics, somewhere in the mid-4th century BC. We're talking at least 400 and probably 80 years before Christ. Maybe 520 years, 30 years before John. Somewhere in that ballpark. And it's, his metaphor was to denote the effects of true tragedy on the spectator. And we're talking about tragedy in the sense that would be highlighted, say, in Shakespearean literature, in which the story doesn't have to end happily ever after, but can have a very tragic plot or a very tragic ending. And the spectator is the audience. Those who are watching or reading that play or that poem and then being emotionally affected by that. You gotta imagine, see this happens to us all the time because we have Hollywood, which is always playing on your emotions. But imagine 400 plus years before Christ and the Greeks are starting to identify that you can get people to move emotionally if you write things down in a certain ma manner. And Aristotle basically coins a word for that. He takes it from the medical term catharsis which is the Greek word for purification. Katharis is the verb of that which is to cleanse. And we used it last week in the Aorus tense where cleanse is not something that's going to happen tomorrow or something that particularly happened yesterday, but something that is ongoing all the time. And I think the illustration we used was um, playing an instrument. I play. Well, no one hears you say that and thinks that you meant you played yesterday or anticipate you will play tomorrow. They think that you mean that that is part of what you do and that that's the tense used in the word cleanse, that, that confessing our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse, aorist tense verbs, that the forgiveness is a done deal, the cleansing is a done deal, but it's an ever ongoing deal. And so it's not as if God's waiting around to cleanse us or waiting around to forgive us until our next sin slash confession, but that's a done deal. And if that's, that's where you derive the word that pops up in 1 John 1, 9, but it's a word that has its roots very deep in Greek. And so that medical term purification, Aristotle believed that the purpose of tragedy was to arouse, and these are his words, terror and pity. And that that would affect a catharsis of these emotions. That you could literally work through. This is how we would say it today. You could work through your stuff. And that's, that's kind of our way of saying it. But Aristotle viewed that as what catharsis was able to do. Interpreters of Aristotle, because we fought for a long time over what did Aristotle really mean by catharsis. Because he surely didn't mean what it means in psychological terms today. Or he's way ahead of the curve. So what might he have meant? And here's a pretty good landing spot. His interpreters often say that our insights and our outlooks are enlarged. Pay close attention to this sentence because this is what got me on this. 
They are enlarged through sympathetic identification with the tragic protagonist. Who might be the tragic protagonist of the New Testament story? We need a little tragedy at the end of our protagonist. Our protagonist is our hero. We have the ultimate tragic ending, by the way, although resurrection flips the script and the story starts over. But if you need tragedy, you need go no further than the Friday afternoon outside of Jerusalem at Calvary where the Gospels start to wind down towards... In fact, one Gospel did wind down there, Mark. And then we have the new creation story which sets Christianity apart. But our tragic protagonist is Jesus. And so in that thought process, John drops that word katharis in, which has all this depth behind it in the Greek. This idea that there is a catharsis. There is a way to work out some of this stuff that whatever it is that is going on. Think about that as you reread that verse. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to provide this form of catharsis from all of our unrighteousness. And so part of our confession is bringing what and who we are to the table. We talked about why that's essential and the dangers of refusal to do that. Once we bring that there... The forgiveness and the cleansing are ever, they're ongoing. It's not as if they start up when I show up. Forgiveness and cleansing is God's work. It's all he's doing. It's all constantly, constantly, constantly. But how can I interpret that as making a difference in me? And maybe what John is doing is borrowing a word that his Greek audience perfectly understands when he says, hey, when you bring it to him, he provides catharsis for you for all of your unrighteousnesses. In other words, you get a chance to work out, to bring all of that stuff to bear, whatever it is that you really are. In this light, this actually to me gives more legs to something we talked about last week, which is confess your sins while that word confess, homologio, say the same thing as, and I told you, so if you, if you demand to talk about your sins, at least talk about them the way Jesus would, which is, I forgive them, I cleanse them. If you, if you demand, I, I, I got to talk about sin. Okay, well, fine. Then homologio, your sin. At least admit what he admits about them. Aorist tense verbs. I forgive them, I cleanse them. I forgive them, I cleanse them. Over and over and over and over and over. Okay, fine. From a broader sense, denying that you have any issues, denying that you have any problems, refuses you the catharsis, the cleansing. It refuses you the chance to bring what you are to him and to lay it at his feet so that he can provide you with something very necessary that you've watched our great protagonist, Jesus, go to a tragic end at the cross. And, And you've started to identify that he was going to the cross for a reason. And you start to identify why was he going to the cross? Maybe for Matt sins, because that's the first thing we always do, is identify why tragedy has to happen for other people. Because I've watched him live, or I've watched her live, and uh, they probably need it. And so that's sort of our first step towards getting it. But that's not enough. We can't deny our own guilt in the process. And so what we do then is we take whatever we have, and we finally start to see it in Jesus. And as we see all of that in Jesus, we start to realize that the catharsis isn't just for him or for her. He needs treatment. She needs treatment. No, me needs some treatment. And in that moment, I'm now able to look at the cross as something that happens on my behalf, my benefit. All right? So I want to... The following statement that I'm going to put up for you, I'm still not landed at 100% pleased with the wording. I worked on it all day in my head. I even, this is one of those moments where I even sent it to some people at random that I felt like the spirit dropped in me to send it to and said, what do you think about this? And I got, I love this because I got mixed bag reviews. I got, it's great, go with it. I got, I don't know about that. And I got maybe which was the, far, that was the perfect spectrum. It was as if the Holy Spirit did that on purpose and went, I'll give you an agreement, I'll give you a maybe, and I'll give you a no. And then you can just like wrestle it out and go at it, which was a lot of fun. All right, and this is the thought. Consider the possibility 
that we have weakened the power of the cross by our insistence that Jesus is innocent, wrongfully accused. I hope that sentence kind of hit you sideways and you went, eh, I don't know about that. Perfect if it did. All right. The extent to which we make Jesus guilty of our transgressions is the extent to which we will let go of those sins in him. So let me work that with you the way I've been sort of working that in me today. And then you hold on to whatever you want to ask and question and, and punch it because I, that's cool. And we'll do that at the end. So um, I probably cross a bridge too far by saying we weaken the cross by seeing Jesus as innocent. I'm willing to... I'm willing to concede that for the shock value of a statement that really needs to get you to think in new terms. Okay? I, I get that. Nothing weakens the cross. The cross needs not our help to be strengthened or to be weakened. So collectively, the statement is really about our consciousness of the cross, not the cross's power. I also would never want anyone to think that I think Jesus failed that he somehow sinned, that he deserved to go to Calvary. Of course not. Even if I had reason to believe that in any other way, I'd have to distrust the Bible, which made it emphatically clear in the book of Hebrews that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So I have no reason to believe that Jesus needs to go to the cross on behalf of his own guilt. So I will say Christ goes completely innocent of having done anything wrong. My point with this argument, and this is where I hope you'll mull this over and wrestle with it a little bit. Perhaps we've weakened its ability to set us completely free from the guilt and shame of our sin because we keep seeing Jesus as innocent instead of guilty on our behalf. If we work hard to say, well, he was innocent, he didn't deserve to die, they shouldn't have killed him. All of those things are true. He was innocent. He didn't sin. And he didn't deserve to die. Now, scratch all of it and start over. He's full of my sin. He is as guilty at Calvary as I would be. Because if not, then who's guilty? See why that wrestling is difficult. Because that, it requires me to start to view the cross through a different lens. And here's where the landing spot I think will be starts to require me to see the cross not as the place where Jesus died for me. It requires me to see the cross as the place that Jesus died as me. And not just as me, but you and you and you and you and everyone who had ever lived and everyone who would ever live. And if you think your sin is bad, try multiplying at times all of the billions of people who have ever lived and then put all of that in Christ. And my point, my hope, my prayer is this, that we can start to see Jesus, not as if Jesus went out and did anything wrong, that would be foolish, but we can start to see Jesus at Calvary as the very picture of what guilt looks like when it gets destroyed. What sin looks like when it faces off with God. That is in Christ at Calvary. I think it's where Paul landed because Paul said that God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself, not counting our sins against us. And then Paul goes on to say, we could be made God's righteousness by realizing that God made him to be sin so that we could be righteous. Whose sin was in Jesus? My sin was in Jesus. Your sin was in Jesus. Our sin was in Jesus. Maybe we, the statement is probably just grammatically incorrect, but maybe we're weakening the cross's ability to set us free from guilt because we're not declaring our guilt as having been punished in the body of Christ. And if we would, why would we carry guilt with us anymore? I guess it's this. I'm not sure that I really believe sometimes that Jesus paid it all. I want to believe it. Theologically, I believe it. I have enough scripture for it. But then I carry my stuff with me. Which sends a bit of a mixed signal, doesn't it? It's to say Jesus paid it all. He paid for everything. He paid for my past. He paid for my present. He paid for my future. He paid for my guilt. He paid for my shame. He paid for my condemnation. Then why do I feel such guilt? 
Did he mess up? Well, no. Maybe I've spent a little too much time focusing on the fact that he wasn't guilty. Maybe for just purposes that help me let go of my guilt, I should spend some time staring at the cross as if what was happening at Calvary was my sin was being punished. You see, to do that, I have to acquiesce to the reality that I have sin, that I do indeed have something worth dying for, something worth dying because of. And then if I put that into Christ, I can let Christ do what Christ needs to do. If we focus all the time on Jesus was innocent and bad people killed him, we're not wrong. By the way, we would be the bad people that would kill him. Um, if nothing else, the Pharisees play that out, by the way, in the Gospels. If you ever wondered, because have you ever thought this? If I could get in time machine and go back, I wouldn't kill him. Um, did you know the Pharisees didn't know anything about time machines, but they said the same thing? Because the Pharisees honored the prophets of the Old Testament. And Jesus called them on it and said, had their deeds been done in your day, you'd have killed them too. And they went nuts. They, they shred their clothes because they didn't believe that. They firmly believed that if they had lived in the time of Isaiah, in the time of Jeremiah, in the time of Ezekiel, in the time of Daniel, they wouldn't have let Daniel go to no lion's den. And Jesus said, not so fast. We're not as good as we think we are. And I think sometimes that's us. We just need to realize that. I'm the one that put him on the cross. You're the one that put him. What we do, what we did, put him there. See your guilt in him, and then you can let go of it. I think this is becoming an issue for me because I, I, I still see people, even in grace, um, people that have been believers for a long, long time, carrying with them guilt. I didn't do this right. I didn't do that right. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have went there. I shouldn't have said this. This is why this is happening to me. God's doing this. I can stand up here all day long trying to express the love of God. God loves you. God's not doing any of that stuff to you. Stop insulting God until you see it in the cross of Jesus Christ. Whatever I say to you, fall on deaf ears. It has to be what you see in him. Now, if we get that, 1 John 1.10 kind of make, starts to make sense because here's the next verse. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Why would we make him a liar? Because what's he going to the cross for? <laughs> Why does God declare Jesus guilty for the sins of the world if you don't have any? And that's John's point. Don't make God out to be a liar because what God thought he was doing was putting our sins into the body of Christ. What Jesus thought he was doing, and pardon that word thought, I know it's not correct. It didn't look like they thought it, but they weren't right. But what Jesus thought he was doing was dying for me. And if I'm now saying there's no need for that, no issues on my part, nothing going on, then of course I make him out to be a liar. Now, all of my stuff, no matter what it is, not only do I want you to see it in Jesus. That's the core of the gospel, by the way. That's what we say to people when we're trying to win them to Jesus is, hey, whatever you did wrong, Jesus paid for it. That's a good introduction to the gospel. Good news, you don't have to be guilty. Good news, you don't deserve death. Christ died on your behalf. Good news, you can have the life of heaven right now on the earth. Why? Because Jesus resurrected. What I did with you just right there was ABC of the gospel. Hopefully, that's what you want to come follow Jesus. And that's the message John gives in the gospel, and that's the message we're reading in the New Testament. So all of that, great, grand, and wonderful. Jesus took all of that. Don't stop there. Don't feel like the gospel message ends at Jesus paid it all at the cross, because now what are you going to do with all the stuff you're carrying? Because you're carrying stuff. Well, you, maybe you start by seeing that he carried it. That's a good place to start. And maybe you don't stop taking it to him. Maybe whatever it is, you don't take it out on me. And you don't take it out on your neighbor. And you don't take it out on your kids. And you don't take it out on your spouse. Instead, you take it out on God. And how can I take it out on God? What do you think the cross is? See, I'm, tr I'm trying to get you to envision the cross through a little different lens. What is the cross? It is everything I did and everything you did being taken out on Jesus. So the whole core of the gospel is everything wrong with me was taken out on Jesus. God took what was in me, put it into Jesus. Jesus knew it was coming. He goes, Father, 
if there's any other way that we could do this without me drinking this cup, because I know what's coming, could we do that instead? And he sweats great drops of blood for a few hours in the middle of the night on his way to the cross. And he goes to the cross because he knows we need to see something die. It's not working watching lambs die because lambs aren't people. We need to see the love of God expressed. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest expression of love. I need to show it to you. And so all of it into Jesus. So what's happening is God, I don't mean God's beating Jesus up. God is taking out on our stuff, our sin, what needs done to our sin, what needs done to it, judged. That's what the cross is. Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw all the judgment into me. Judgment of what? Judgment against Paul White's stuff. He's got a lot of it. And now insert your name here and you're ready to rock because now you could put it all into Jesus. But you don't stop seeing it all in Jesus there. Whatever you have, careful not to take it out on me. Careful not to take it out on him. Careful not to take it out on her. Instead, turn it. Turn it towards the Father. Think of it like this. Paul says this in Ephesians 4. Now watch this. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now I want you to notice that everything in 31 is an emotional response to your neighbor. You're bitter, you're wrathful, you're angry, you're clamor, you're evil speaking. All of that stuff is you outward on who's next to you. And how does God deal with it? Put it away. Oh, well, that's, that's a lot of help. Put it away from you. That's what Paul says. So if, you got, if you're mad about something that he did to you, just put it away from you. If you're bitter, put it away. If you're angry, put it away. Clamor, put it away. Evil speaking, put it away. We're just like two steps from a self-help conference here. How do I put it away? I don't have any equipment in 31 to put it away. It's a problem. But who's I'm, who am I taking this stuff out on? That's external stuff, man. That's the stuff you dude's beating up his wife over and getting into a fight at work over. And you're losing friends and making enemies in 31. And you're supposed to just put it away. How do you put it away? Be kind to one another. Well, there's a, here's a good place to start. Flip the action so that how you treat other people starts to change, tenderhearted, but none of these are easy. And then here it comes. Paul drops it on you. Forgive one another, and you're going to have to have this because if you don't have this last part, none of it's going to matter, even as God in Christ forgave you. So what's Paul's key? You need to know that your bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking has been put into Christ. If you don't see it in Christ, you're left holding the bag. And that's why you're biting people's heads off. And that's why you're out here fighting your enemies. And that's why you're turning on the world. Not because you haven't learned just not to put it away, but you don't know where it was put away. 31 tells you to put it away. 32 tells you where it's been put away. Where's it been put away? As God forgave you in Christ. How'd God forgive you? Aorist tense verb. Yesterday, today, and forever. He cleansed you. The catharsis is you taking it to him whom you know has already paid for it and putting it away where he put it away. It's the only hope that we have. If what is wrong with you has been placed into Christ on the cross, then God is not shocked by your feelings or your emotions. Your Ephesians 4.31 stuff isn't scaring God. All your anger and your clamor and your bitterness and your evil speaking... You can cast all of them onto him and you can cast all of them into him. As Peter says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Why would you cast it onto him? Why cast it onto him? Because he already put it all in him and went to the cross. He prefers it. He prefers what? Let me start over. He prefers that you cast all of your stuff onto him and into him. He prefers it rather than you casting them onto others. That's Ephesians 4, 31, 32. You can take all your junk and you can go out here and ruin people's day with it. That's easy to do. And you can live a war in a world where it is dog eat dog and tear people up and the strong survive and you've got that option. And you can live by the sword and in many, 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 many ways you will die repeatedly by the sword. And whatever way you're swinging it, it will come back to you. 
And God loves your neighbor so much and he loves that spouse and he loves those kids and he loves your boss and he loves your enemy and he loves the guy across the street. No more or less than he loves you, but his concern for them is paramount just as much as it is for you. And if you can take what it is with you and you can put it into him, you don't put it onto others. This is the catharsis that comes through the blood of the cross. It's linked to our confession because we can't get rid of what we don't acknowledge. So how do I get rid of it? What do I do? I'm glad you asked. The Old Testament literature is chock full of angry people talking to God. It is. Angry people talking about God and angry people talking to God. Now you would think that the God of the universe would get tired of people talking angry to him, telling him every little thing, all their problems, all their issues, all their stuff. But one of the reasons why the Old Testament consistently calls God long-suffering is because he knows how to suffer a long time with our stuff. It's us that has to be making him suffer. Stop blaming that on the devil. We are his created beings. We are the ones running fast and hard the other way. So whatever suffering he's going through has to be on behalf of us, because of us. And yet the literature of the Old Testament is full of people who see God moving too slow for their liking, not killing their enemies fast enough for them, not doing the things they need done. You could call some of the Old Testament anger literature. There are anger songs in the book of Psalms. Songs where the artist is mad. And they're not just mad at the world. They're not just mad at their neighbor. They're mad at God. And yet God doesn't reach down with lightning bolts and strike them down and go, how dare you say that about me? In fact, if you start to assemble a lot of this anger literature, it gets quite incredible, quite incredulous. I'll put a few of them together for you. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry out to you, violence and you don't save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Boy, that is an exciting book. That's the first four verses of Habakkuk chapter 1. Welcome to the races. How about we go verse by verse through Habakkuk in our next study. First four verses is basically the author going, you know and you don't care. Because you're not showing up. You're not doing what I need you to do. You're not being the God you promised me you'd be. That's not entirely unusual. Look at Psalm 6.3. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Quite simply, I'm in trouble. Where are you? It'd be nice if you showed up. 6.6, six, I'm weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. I'm really glad the third line exists because if the second one stood by itself, he just needs to stop drinking liquid so late in the night before he goes to bed. <laughs> At least that was my first thought when I read this. He goes, your bed's swimming, that's a problem. But he wants to be sure you know it's not that. He drenches his couch with tears. This is, this is uh, the God's man of faith and power. That's how, that's how he's viewed. Uh, next. Psalm 10.1. Why do you stand afar off, Lord? Why do you hide? In times of trouble, just want to pause right here for a second. And I want to explain to you what I'm trying to do before I get done doing it. I want to show you that anger literature is part of your heritage. Getting mad at God is part of your ancestral heritage. God doesn't wipe them off the face of the earth with it. In fact, all the while, as God's hearing the anger literature, Jesus is walking up the other side of the mountain. I mean, there's you taking little Isaac up. God's going to provide himself a lamb, Isaac. God's going to provide himself a lamb, Isaac. You get to the top of that mountain, where's that ram been the whole time? You didn't see him. As far as you know, God's not doing anything until you get up there. You need your ram, and there he is. As far as you know, God doesn't care at all. And yet here comes Jesus over the other side. You never know exactly what it is God is doing. And God is okay with you losing patience over what God is or perceived to not be doing. Why do you hide when times get tough. Psalms 13, 1 to 2. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I take counsel? My soul, I have sought on my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Good questions. Junk is happening to me. Next. 
Lord, how long will you look on? Psalm 35. Rescue me from their destruction. My precious life from the lions. Psalm 35, 22. This you've seen, Lord. Don't keep silence, O Lord. Don't be far from me. Stir up yourself. Awaken my vindication to my cause, my God and my Lord. Next. Psalm 89, 46, how long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Guys, I just picked a few. It got exhausting. I, I thought they're only gonna be able to handle six or eight, because really you, you can. And you go, what if this was coming your way all the time? How long, how long, how long, how long? When, when, when? Lamentations 5, 20. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? This is their attitude. Next screen. God can handle your stuff. He paid for it, and he paid for it in the body of Jesus. Let him have it. I got a little double meaning with let him have it. Let him have it. Let him have your stuff, and let him have it. Go ahead. What's cast all your cares on him mean if not tell him how you feel? I'm not happy with what you're doing, God. I'm not happy with what you've done. I'm a little bit bitter. If I hold it in, I'm going to eat him alive. I'm going to tear her head off. So I'm going to come to you with it. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not happy that you didn't show up when I needed you. I'm not happy that you didn't heal so-and-so. I'm not happy that you didn't deliver me from this. I'm not happy that you didn't show up here. I'm just not happy about it. And I'm not going to set on it anymore. I'm going to bring it to you because there's a catharsis that happens in the cleansing with confession. As I bring it to you, you're already doing something. This is the promise of 1 John 1, 9. You are already doing something. I may not see it. And everybody around me may not see it. And I can get mad at everyone and tear their head off and ruin their lives and mine. But I'm going to go to you because you're a big boy and you can handle it. So I'm going to let you have it. Don't deny you have an issue. That tries to make God out to be a 1 John 1.10 liar. That is you saying, no, no problems here. I'll just fix a few things here. Things will get better. No, bring it to God. Lay it in front of him. Here's the problem and here's what I don't like about it. And as you lay it out in front of him, you let him go to work. Here was one of Psalms' rebuttals. Psalms 145.18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. Look at this. To all who call upon him in truth. So don't you dare go to him acting like you got nothing to say. Because if you really want him, you better show up with some truth. And truth is not just, oh, he loves me. I'm God's righteousness. I'm forgiven. No, truth is, let me tell you how ticked off I am about what's going on in my life. Let me tell you what I expected and what I got instead. Let me tell you that I didn't get this and I needed it. And I needed that and I got this. And where were you? And that's okay. Because you want to know what's, man... That's a good father. And he stands there and goes, what do you got? Come on, man. Give it to me. I'm not, I'm not taunting you. I'm inviting you. What do you got? You mad at me? It's okay. Tell me about it. You angry? Tell me about it. You bitter? Tell me about it. I disappointed you, didn't I? I let you down. I have a plan. Come here. It's ministered to my heart today as I was assembling this because I've had some qualms with God in my own walk. And I felt the Holy Spirit say this is going gonna, gonna to touch the room. It's going to touch people past the room because if they're honest, and I want everyone to hear this, here and there, if you're honest, there's a really good chance you've got something you want to tell God. you get that old religious side of you that goes you're not allowed to do that. But I'm opening a little window for you tonight giving you a little bit of permission, letting you see that the literature backs me up and letting you see that the catharsis of confession is that God keeps working, keeps moving, keeps washing. Don't lie to him. Don't make him out to be a liar that you don't have any issues. You do. It's okay. What do you think the cross is for? It's not some historical event they made a movie out of. It's an ever-going, ever-living, ever-moving Full color example of the heartbeat of a loving father. He goes, all your stuff, I'm going to put it right here. Cast your cares on me. I care for you. But you better bring the truth, man. Don't come and lie to me because you're really lying to yourself. And the one that gets hurt the most is you. Bring to me what you have and lay it at my feet. And don't lie. Be real. Right there, you and I can heal. Something can happen. It's only going to happen in an environment of truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, 
and the truth shall make you free. Jesus didn't mean you shall know correct doctrine and you'll be freer than the church across the street. No, he meant when you know what is true, true freedom can come because you've stopped lying to yourself. And when you stop lying to yourself about how you feel and about how you felt and about what you expect, truth happens, then you're truly free. You may be 10 steps back from where you thought you were once you get honest. That's okay. That other you was 10 steps ahead too far. He was a little bit fake. This is the real you, broken and shattered. All the disillusionment's gone. Standing in front of God going, here's what I am. Here's who I am. If catharsis is real, and 1 John 1, 9 seemed to think that it was, not just Aristotle, but bringing Christ into the middle of it to go, if you opened your mouth and you expected, and you said what you were, you could expect that the cleansing would happen and keep happening and keep happening. Which leads me to here, which is where I want to land. James 5, 16. We did a little bit of on this last week and I felt all week like I didn't do enough because it didn't give you the context you needed to really run with this, all right? I felt like tonight that foundation we just gave might open this up and it might make you more honest with me and me more honest with you and if that happens, everybody wins because we're not lying. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Next screen. Eximologio is the word confess, not homologio. Homologio is 1 John 1, 9. Say the same thing as. James doesn't use that word. James uses a word that means confess or profess to acknowledge openly and to acknowledge joyfully. So the presentation you're giving to each other over your sin is not boo-hoo, look what's wrong with me. It's, hey, I've spotted this truth in me and I'm going to hand it to you as well. This is what's going on in me and I need your help. This is why I'm confessing it laterally. I'm not confessing it vertically. God knows about it anyway. I'm confessing it laterally, whatever it is, because it's an issue that I want to acknowledge openly so we can have joy together. The earliest Greek manuscript we have of the book of James included the word therefore to kick off James 5.16. It's not in our English and it's unfortunate. But that word indicates that our lateral confession was predicated on information contained in the previous verses. So let's put those up. 513. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Notice you're praying and you're singing psalms. Those are the same thing. What do you think you're praying if you're suffering? You might be telling the truth that we got tired of looking at from Psalms. Where are you, God? Where are you, God? Where are you, God? Where are you, God? Where are you? James goes, that's okay. That's part of the experience. Are you suffering? Talk to God about it. That's not just like, God, I'm suffering. I need help. It's being honest. Here's why I'm suffering. Here's what I don't like. Here's what I don't understand. So take that to him. Are you cheerful? Sing some Psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, In my experience, and I don't want to stay here long because I really want to land, but this we kind of stopped here with just anoint people with oil. So if we had anointing with oil sessions in church, and so if you needed heal, come up, we'll anoint you with oil, which is fine. But we based it on this verse, and we didn't look at the whole context of what James is trying to do. We made a little bit of a magic talisman out of the oil, like the oil's got to be a certain kind and purchased from a certain place. And when we do that, when we when we miss the forest for the trees, everybody suffers. All right, so I don't think it's all James is trying to do. So watch where he goes. Then the prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. And here comes an odd one. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Ooh, that's interesting. There's a link there to a sickness that they hope that they have and a sin that needs forgiven. Don't miss that link. And don't act like the link's universal. This only shows up here. And maybe it's because it's an exomologio link. Maybe it's because it's a lateral confession that there's something going on in their body that is related to the something they won't let go of. Notice they need both healed and forgiven. How do you get forgiveness of sins? Tell me about your sin? No, that's not 1 John 1, 9. But how might you get over whatever that sin's doing to you? Might be time to let somebody in on what something's happening in your life. And that's James's point. So the prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess. That's the missing word. 
Therefore, confess your trespasses. Why therefore? Because there's an unbelievable amount of catharsis that could happen to you if you release what it is you've been carrying around with you. In fact, you carrying it around with you might be killing you. And man, is that true. You know how many medical professionals say that... I, I read one medical professional said that 50% of what ails people is related to something that has, is happening up here or in here that has nothing to do with biology, has nothing to do with diet, it has nothing to do with genes. It has to do with what they carry. And letting go of it. And you say, where do we get that in the Bible? James 5. That maybe some things are linked to what I won't let go of. Therefore, let go of them. And then pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective, the effective that's energe energetic in the Greek. The energetic prayer of a righteous man avails much. You're the righteous man, but you're carrying things you don't have to carry. There's no need for it. Now take all of that info back and let's land this plane. First John 1, oh, ooh, yeah. I think I actually said this, but we'll read it. James connects some illness to sin by linking healing and forgiveness. He can say, therefore confess, because he sees the weight that we carry as the possible source of what ails us. Yes, all right. If we can, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I hope that has a lot of life to you now. Here's John's next phrase. My little children. These things I write to you so that you may not sin. Look, I, I'm not, I don't want you sinning. That's the whole point. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We are on our way to something remarkable. What did we have to do before we get there? We had to pick up what's wrong with us so that we could lay it down in the one that matters. Now that John's got you ready to do that, this glorious move we're going to make in chapter 2 because we're going to get introduced to the propitiation of our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. What a beautiful thing. Bow your head with me if you would. I want to pray, and I want to pray something um, fairly specific. All right? I watched the Holy Spirit do a work in this room tonight. I saw it with my eyes, and I felt it in my spirit and my heart. I also know that he's going to do that tonight and tomorrow and the next day and the next week and the next month and the next year for the people all over the world who are being impacted by this study. So I'm not just going to pray for this room tonight. I want to pray for all of them as well. All right? Father, we thank you that you take all of our stuff, that you're not scared off by us or mad at us. We thank you that you've put all of it into Jesus so that we have no right to carry it on our own. Father, everyone that's in this room and everyone that's watching that considers themselves in this room, I think your Holy Spirit's revealing some stuff to us. We've been bitter. We've been angry. We've been evil speaking. A lot of times we take it out on the people around us and what we really want to do is tell you off because we're disappointed. We're disappointed you didn't do this or you didn't do that. We're disappointed you dropped the ball when we thought you should have caught it. We're disappointed you didn't heal when we thought you should. We're disappointed you didn't show up and we were left standing there by ourselves. And even though we know in our spirit you never left us and you never forsook us, we just couldn't see the ram coming up the other side. Forgive us for where we didn't bring truth to you, where we kept bringing the lie. And we realize if we could bring the truth to you, you have a never-ending, ever-flowing, cathartic river that flows and that we can have everything you have promised us through Christ. I don't know how to get it for the people in this room. I don't know how to get it for the people that are watching. But I do know it starts with us being honest. Help me to do that, Father. Help all of us to do that. Let that begin where it can only end in you, in Jesus' name. Now before you say amen, and you don't have to say it out loud, but you've got some stuff and you give it to him. Throw it his way. It's all right. And it doesn't end tonight. It begins tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.